Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP, so Ukraine War news update for the 8th of October 2023. Uh, I gave you a short update earlier today on its kind of losses and hits and strikes and whatnot uh, that's taken place over the last 24 hours. We're going to look at military aid topic and then geopolitical uh, subjects, but we'll be mainly concentrating on the situation in Israel and also a little bit of a look at how that pertains to Ukraine. Anyway, let's go first to military aid. Uh, Denmark purchases a factory to restart domestic ammunition production. Denmark brought the same fa facility that it had sold in 2008 and will restart production. Several private companies are expected to run it. So obviously some kind of state private uh, cooperative um, enterprise going on there that will hopefully help to plug that gap in terms of ammunition and even if they are only making it for domestic usage then that that's arguably backfilling stuff that they've already given to ukraine it's all part of the mix and it's all part of keeping nato strong as well so that's hugely important i think you'll be seeing a lot of this or we have seen a lot of this already with domestic production in a number of countries ramping up to uh levels that haven't been seen for a good long time uh, on the other hand russia is ramping up production of iranian sh designed shahid drones according to ukraine's air force last winter russia launched about a thousand of these while only in september 2023 they've launched 500 so six months they launched a thousand the last month they have launched 500 that is a significant um number of these that the that the russians have uh, at their fingertips to be able to send and they are sending them they are obviously a real threat to ukrainian uh, security now there's also a dramatic increase in uh, north korean border rail traffic after the kim putin summit uh, so here we have an image it shows locomotive probable tank car approximately 73 box cars probable personnel and equipment in these boxes covered shipping crates and containers and equipment laid out in open air and covered shipping crates and containers and equipment laid out in open air as well over there so there's also been reports that they are sending artillery that would obviously be easier to ascertain as far as what it is from uh, satellite imagery this doesn't look like artillery obviously but almost certainly ammunition and other equipment that the russians desperately need this is this is a real I think a real challenge again for the Ukrainians here. So key finding satellite imagery of North Korea's uh, Tomangang rail facility in the border with Russia captured on October the 5th, 2023, so, so three days ago, shows an unprecedented number of freight rail cars totaling approximately 73. The level of rail traffic is far greater than what Beyond Parallel, so that's his website, has observed at the facility during the past five years, even compared to pre-COVID-19 levels. Given that Kim and Putin discussed some military exchanges and cooperation at their recent summit, the dramatic increase in rail traffic likely indicates North Korea's supply of arms and munitions to Russia. However, the extensive use of tarps to cover the shipping crates and containers uh, and equipment makes it impossible to conclusively identify what is seen in the rail facility. Developments elsewhere at the Tomangang rail facility indicate that North Korea is not simply planning to resume border traffic to pre-COVID-19 levels, but further expand the facility's capacity at this border crossing. Military transfers between the two countries would violate multiple UN Security Council resolutions and be subject to additional sanctions by the United States and its allies. It's interesting that if this violates a UN Security Council resolution and the, and Russia sits on a, uh, have a permanent seat at that Security Council, then you know what gives here? Something has to happen. There needs to be ramifications. Of course, trying to prove what this stuff is will be difficult, but you can rest assured that there will be intelligence agencies that will be pouring over satellite imagery uh, of, of where this has come from you know can they can they map this equipment from sort of factory or storage you know onto vehicles and then to the railway station and then onto the railway uh onto the box cars and then likewise at the other end from the railway uh, station to its eventual destination if they can prove that this is indeed uh, in contravention of those agreements and this will be i think really serious not only for north korea fairly well sanctioned right but for in terms of russia and can i mean i'd love it if something like this can be used to just get russia off the security council to the un and then get the un able to do something um but yeah this is well worth looking at 
um and uh yeah good um good website with lots and lots of details as you can see here uh i'm wondering it doesn't i don't think it's it mentions anything about uh the un though that that's what i would certainly like to uh see discussed somewhere but anyway uh good stuff uh and then that's being reported now elsewhere uh outside of that report so you can see using the images from from that um north korea has dramatically increased the number of cargo shipments to russia um and it's suspected these were arms shipments okay then Biden may seek $100 billion aid package for Ukraine. Sorry, I should have put this first, really. I don't know why this is at the end. Uh, the White House hopes a one-and-done funding package will bypass the deadlock with congressional Republicans and free up enough aid for Ukraine to last the 24, 2024 presidential campaign. So, election. This is really important. It would be great if they could just... The one-and-done idea is that you don't want to keep uh, in dribs and drabs, keep on getting... Uh, permission or, or getting um, the con Congress to sign off on various shipments, right? You just want to say, right, here's 100 billion, that covers it for the whole year. It's not to say that that shipment will go out in one. You can still do it in dribs and drabs and, and you know, wait to see what Ukraine needs and uh, adapt in that in that way but it's saying right we've got 100 billion dollars now to play with it, we don't have to keep securing uh, the amount each time uh, i think that would be far better you can do it when you're much safer in terms of political support for ukraine you're thinking well if, if we're looking down the line and we see we think that maybe during the election uh, period that, that actually this is going to be a bit of a hot potato as a topic it's not a vote winner maybe for trying to get some of those uh, people in the middle or, or the GOP might use this uh, for leverage, so on and so forth. Say, so, right, let's, let's just get it out of the way now uh, and it won't be affected by the changing political winds going forward. So that, I think, would be a preferable scenario. And I hope Biden is able to do that. Right, let's go now to geopolitical stuff. Uh, we'll start off with, I think I've only got one piece that directly pertains to Ukraine war, the Ukraine war. One in five Europe-based Russian spies are located in Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland is increasingly becoming a base for Russia's secret services, with about 80 Russian spies in the country, according to an investigation by Swiss newspaper Neue Zürcher Zeitung. Uh, interesting. Um, I, yeah, I wonder what that tells us, what that means, what the ramifications for that. But uh, yes, yeah, Switzerland appears to be a hotbed for uh, Russian subterfuge. Okay, now we're going to move on to Israel. Let's go over, first of all, relatively quickly, and this is a very complicated topic area. And in fact, what I'll do first is just have a look at a little bit of geography to, to get you guys, like I'm treating you like you know nothing about this. I know very little about this area, so you know, forgive me. Uh, hopefully we can learn together. So Israel, you have Israel here on the edge of the Mediterranean, right in this kind of pocket of other countries. You've got Lebanon to the north. You've got a little part of Syria there. You've got Jordan and you've got, uh, you've got Israel itself, obviously. And then you've got Egypt down here. And remember, there has been several wars, Yom Kippur War, the Six Day War, where Israel you know, took it back to some of the countries who, who invaded and in fact kind of annexed some of their land. And this is what we're going to look at now. There are three areas of, I mean, Israel is not not a simple country, right? And there are three areas that are effectively annexed areas. So you've got the Gaza Strip here, which is a very small, incredibly densely populated area on the coast of the Mediterranean. Uh, so if you actually go in there, you can see that it's just city. And its population is still increasing by that 2.9%, I think. Uh, it's just, yeah, that's and it's it's blockaded as well. So that's the Gaza Strip. Then you have the West Bank. Now, the West Bank is a much larger area that uh, is called the West Bank because it's on the West Bank of the Jordan River. So this area is also a kind of annexed area with Palestinians in, but also Israelis. And then you have the Golan Heights up here, another sort of annexed area close to Syria and Lebanon. Okay, uh, let's have a look at those areas there separately just to give you, again, a quick kind of synopsis of what they are. So the Gaza Strip um, is, or simply Gaza, is a Palestinian enclave on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. The smaller of the two Palestinian territories, it borders uh, Egypt on the southwest uh, 
for 11 kilometers and Israel on the east and north along a 51 kilometer border. Together, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank make up the state of Palestine. Okay, so let's just go back to the map. So the state of Palestine is made up of this area and this area within Israel. Okay, so it, this is where it gets like super complicated. Um, okay. The strip is 41 kilometers long, 6 to 12 kilometers wide, has a total area of 365 square kilometers, with around 2 million Palestinians on some 365 square kilometers. Gaza is considered a top-level political unit, ranks as the third most densely populated in the world. The majority of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are descendants of refugees who fled or were expelled from what is now Israel during the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. Sunni Muslims, who make up a predominant uh, part of the population in the Gaza Strip, uh, also, there are Palestinian Christian minority there. Gaza has an annual population growth of 2.91%, the 13th highest in the world, and is often referred to as overcrowded. Gaza suffers from shortages of water, electricity, and medicines. The UN, as well as at least 19 human rights organizations, have urged Israel to lift its siege on Gaza. While a report by UNCTAD prepared for the UN General Assembly and released on the 25th of November 2020 said that Gaza's economy was on the verge of collapse and that it was essential to lift the blockade. So that gives you some idea of how people inside the Gaza Strip feel about Israel being blockaded, uh, not being able to get access to medicine, water, electricity, particularly easily. It is it is pretty, uh, pretty difficult place. Um, it, it's also seen as kind of there are ideas that it's illegally annexed, as we'll see of the um, of the West Bank as well. So going on to the West Bank, it's a similar kind of state of affairs here uh, that m it makes up part the part of you know the territory of Palestine the west bank including east jerusalem has a has a land area of 5640 square kilometers so much bigger plus a water area of 220 square kilometers consisting of the northwestern quarter of the dead sea there's estimated population of 2.7 million Palestinians and over 670,000 Israeli settlers live in the West Bank, of which approximately 220,000 live in East Jerusalem. The international community considers Israeli settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem to be illegal under international law, although Israel disputes this. A 2004 advisory ruling by the International Court of Justice concluded that the events that came after the 1967 capture of the West Bank by Israel, including the Jerusalem Law, the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty and the Oslo Accords, did not change the status of the West Bank and East Jerusalem as Israeli occupied territory. Alongside the self governing Gaza Strip, the Israeli occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem are claimed by the state of Palestine as its sovereign territory and thus remain a flashpoint of the Israeli Palestine conflict, Palestinian conflict. So this is it's complicated right and there will be people who think that the israelis have the right to this land and you know you got religion involved and you got the idea that basically the israeli people were kind of dumped there after the second world war thus moving the people who already lived there out of the way you know as a as a result of what took place in the second world war and I would say broad my simplistic view of this whole situation it's basically unsolvable uh, and I think the evidence that it's unsolvable is we're still here all these years later and it hasn't been solved and I, and I, I just don't know that you can solve this anyway you've got the Golan Heights so the Golan Heights is is this northern area that is nearer to um, to Lebanon so that's here and the Golan Heights uh, just to give you a quick snapshot of this um, what, since the Six-Day War 1967, the western two-thirds of the Golan Heights have been occupied and administered by Israel, whereas the, west, the eastern third remains under the control of Syria. Following the war, Syria dismissed any negotiations with Israel as part of the Khartoum Resolution at the 1967 Arab League Summit. Construction of Israeli settlements began in the remainder of the territory held by Israel, which was under a military administration until the Knesset, that's the Israeli parliament, passed the Golan Heights law in 1981, which applied Israeli law to the territory. The move has been described as an annexation so you, interesting parallels to ukraine but you know with israel being similar to russia in in that respect and that's obviously highly controversial and you get a lot of uh jewish people will be like no that that's not the case and it's just really complicated the golden heights law was decision to um the Golan Heights law, sorry, was condemned by the UN Security Council Resolution 497, which stated that the Israeli decision to impose its laws, jurisdiction and administration in the occupied Syrian Golan Heights is null and void and without international legal effect. And Resolution 242, which emphasizes the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war, 
Israel maintains it has a right to retain the Golan, also citing the text, text of Resolution 242, which calls for secure and recognized boundaries free from threats of acts or acts of force. With the onset of the Syrian civil war in 2011, control of the Syrian administered part of the Golan Heights was split between the state government and Syrian opposition forces, with the United Nations Disengagement Observer Force remain, uh, maintaining a 266 square kilometer buffer zone in between to help implement the Israeli-Syrian ceasefire across the Purple Line. Uh, so on and so forth. So that whole issue with Syria is also involved in that part of uh, occupied uh, Israel. So it's just what a hot mess. Okay, so given that Hamas is the uh, political group that has uh, been in charge of Gaza, in fact, uh, if we find that... I, Let's see if I can find that. Yes, yeah, so uh, here, the territories of Gaza and West Bank were separated from each other by Israeli territory. Both are under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority, but the Strip is governed by Hamas, a militant fundamentalist Islamic organization, which came to power in the last held elections in 2006. So there were elections, they did come to power, but there haven't been them since 2006. Since then, Gaza has been under a full Israel-led land, sea, and air blockade. This presents... presents people and goods from freely entering and leaving the territory, leading to the territory being called an open-air prison. And that's the issue, is that, that if there's no recognised democracy and it's led by what Israel see as, as a terrorist organisation, then that's going to mean they're harder on Gaza Strip, which then will make the people in Gaza Strip resent the Israelis more, which will drive them further to Hamas. And that cycle continues and... It's, it's, there's no easy way out of it. Okay, so what's happened over the last few days? Well, okay, Lebanon's Hezbollah has now attacked Israel with mortar fire. So that is now is not just these attacks that have been going on down to the south, but Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah, which is uh, an Islamic terrorist group up here, have now been throwing um, their weight into or some mortar fire into uh, Israel. The IDF, the Israel Defense Force, uh, Israeli Defense Force, said it was launching retaliatory strikes against Lebanon. The Israeli army continues to quote clean up settlements and bases fr from terrorists. A total of seven hundred, possibly as many as a thousand, Hamas militants were involved in Saturday's attack on Israel. Israel's Prime Minister says the first phase of the operation Iron Swords has been completed and most of the terrorists have been eliminated. You got Benjamin Netanyahu, who is a very like right wing, st strong man kind of leader, but he's actually not, as far as I understand it, not been very well thought of in terms of his military stance uh, and positions against things like Hamas uh, and this might become a bit of an undoing for him because this has kind of come out of the blue really big surprise intelligence uh, intelligence agencies are being well criticized um and I don't think Netanyahu is kind of well regarded in this particular type of context um but yeah uh the Israeli army said it hit 426 targets in the Gaza Strip including 10 high-rise Rises used by Hamas. Tens of thousands of Israeli soldiers are involved in the operation. Iran has supported the Palestinian group in carrying out the attack. Hamas spokesperson Ghazi Hamad told BBC. So that's a Hamas spokesperson saying Iran have supported them. Israel's health ministry said more than 300 residents were killed. Actually, that's above 400. Some saying 500 now uh, were killed and 1,864 injured. About 750 people have been reported missing. In the Gaza Strip, 256 people were killed and 1,788 injured, Sky News Arabia said. So there's been really strong strong retaliations as you can imagine and um what happened basically is that uh if we if we go to these in the Gaza strip area you had breaking through of the fences and lots of militants and just general people breaking through and causing havoc uh attacking uh, military bases kind of smaller military bases police stations and whatnot uh, Sterot here, this city was the one where you had Hamas particularly going around just indiscriminately shooting Israeli civilians. They've they've taken loads of civilians, cap they've captured, they've taken them hostage, loads of civilians. Don't know how many, 750 people are still missing, but there are people. There was a rave that was taking on near there where suddenly you had people coming in on parachutes with like little microcopters behind them. They're quite an like aside from how terrible it is quite an interesting array of stuff on show here you've got lots of drone activity 
yeah and and they they hit this rave and lots of people were taken hostage at the rave people were killed and lots of ravers or lots of people at the party like ran into ravines and bushes and whatnot and they're now only just coming out now and this has happened like quite some time ago so yeah and th that's a general area but it's you know one's unsure of exactly how widespread Hamas militants are in this kind of area uh, the extremely fluid situation in southern Israel makes it hard to define a coherent front line um, uh, says Tendar and uh, in fact uh, there is not really one. The Palestinian terrorists slipped through partially in platoon strength, or you can say that certain areas have a different degree of a Palestinian terror presence marked in orange, m going some uh, sometimes all the way to Ashkelon, Kiryat Gat, and Ofakim. So uh, you don't need to go. You can look on the map where they are. IDF, in con conjunction with police forces, are starting to eliminate the Palestinian terrorist presence, and they encounter uh, uh, areas of total carnage, especially around. Kibbutz Reim, horrific pictures arrive. Palestinian terrorists still control some parts of the border area east and north of Gaza, marked in red, which means that in those areas at the moment they can walk openly around. Okay, so uh, Palestine has called for an emergency meeting of the Arab League, so that will be trying to get Arab support for for Hamas and for what they have done. And the way I, I understand it, the way they're selling it is that Israel is escalating this. Which, it's difficult. I mean, what would you expect Israel to do? Of course, they're going to go absolutely strong on this, right? So to blame Israel for escalation, I think, is is problematic, given that you did this. But then the whole situation is problematic. You know, according to the publication, the request for the meeting is dictated by the brutal and ongoing Israeli aggression against the Palestinian people. The league is formed of 22 nations, including Egypt, Iraq and Saudi Arabia. Egypt has been asked to help out, but then... Goodness me, a policeman in Egypt has just gone down to Israeli tourists and their Egyptian tour guide. So, you know, it's a bit of a bubbling cauldron all over the place. Now, apparently the Hamas leader, uh, Ayman Yunus, has been killed. The body of, and of the head of Hamas was found under rubble in, in an Israeli strike. Um, so that's, uh, some say he's not the leader uh, or the head. He's a senior Hamas figure, that's all, says, but... There are there are different claims as to this chap. Uh, Israel is preparing to fight in addition to Palestine with Lebanon. So then, you know, going to the north, the Israeli army began moving hundreds of tanks to the Pilon area uh, near the Lebanese and Syrian border. Earlier, Lebanese Hezbollah began to mobilize its resources to start a potential war with Israel. And there's all sorts of footage of Israeli equipment. They've got a very adept armed force, armed force, forces with um quite a lot of good quality tech and weaponry but they you know they were caught so off guard here that they've you know you had a tank getting blown up a drone dropped on it with a dead tank uh crew member being dragged out and it was all pretty horrible there's yeah there's uh bases being overrun so it was really it was a surprise attack that didn't didn't end well for for uh israel but then if the reaction the reaction might well be uh, much more in favour of Israel. There's, there's a big asymmetry, arguably, here. Uh, footage of the transfer of Israeli military equipment at the border with Gaza Strip. So you've got you know, two elements to, the, to this military equipment. Right. OK, how does this pertain to Ukraine? So Dmitry said, I was monitoring my usual Russian channels all day yesterday. I think the sentiment towards Israel ranges between negative and neutral. So this is from Russians, right? So they think they're not really bothered about Israel or they're negative to to Israel but it's never positive right the negative sentiment comes from the usual suspects imperialist fascists and of course Wagnerites these folk would like Israel to go down and they're being open about it even though they may not directly sympathize with the Palestinians so so we don't really like the Palestinians but maybe the enemy of my enemy is my friend or at least the enemy of my enemy is kind of like we'll forget about that but so some Russians see you know the maybe Russia there's 15 percent Russian speakers in Israel right so there's a lot of Russians there but are these Russian Jews who have escaped uh the Russian Federation because they don't want to be there and in, in which case there is a lack of sympathy for these people from 
um, R- Russians still back in Russia, so on and so forth. And you've got ultra nationalists who might be anti Semitic as well. Uh, these folks would like Israel to go down and they're being open about it. Okay. So a more neutral position can be observed among those who are more closely aligned with the authorities, such as official propagandists and military cor- correspondents. But they all recognize that this situation benefits their effort in trying to conquer Ukraine. So this is the opportunism that I think we can expect out of Russia. And all of them will be pushing fakes about Ukraine, as always. So we've already seen fake footage of weaponry that's claimed to be Ukrainian weaponry that's been given to uh, to Hamas by Ukraine. It's like, that's never going to have happened. It's like really good footage, really good quality footage. You're like, yeah, this is just propaganda uh, with someone speaking in Arabic over it. Like, that, that hasn't happened. Um, but we're already seeing these kind of fates coming out. Being somewhat involved in providing armament to Hamas along with other BS. Be careful when browsing. So it's, you know, a big warning to everyone. Kremlin, the ISW says Kremlin exploits Hamas attack on Israel to, in information operation to drive down assistance for Ukraine. Kremlin propagandists blame the West for neglecting the Middle East and portray uh, attention in the Middle East or Ukraine as zero-sum comparison. So again, we get back to the zero-sum game Um idea which is that if you give support to ukraine that is not that you would otherwise have given that support to israel so the reason this has all happened in israel and like aside from the fact that hamas has just invaded it's nothing to do with like assistance to israel but the re the, the way that they the russians are are playing this is that the reason that that the activities that happened in Israel was because you've been paying money to Ukraine and not to Israel. So it's your fault, the West type thing, right? Simplification, but you get my point. So Kremlin exploits a mass attack on Israel. Okay, so here we have... Um, uh, Let's just dip into this. So the Hamas Palestinian fundamentalist organization started its terrorist attacks against Israel on the 7th. Political leaders in the West and World War condemn the attack and express their solidarity with Israel. Ukrainian President Zelensky also stressed that, quote, the world must stand united and in solidarity so that terror does not attempt to break or subjugate life anywhere uh, and at any moment. He affirmed Israel's right to self-defense is unquestionable. Zelensky hinted that Iran and Russia are backing Hamas, saying that the whole world understands that sponsors could ensure the organization of Hamas attack on Israel. Now, it gets difficult here because Zelensky's got a really tough job because the parallels of Israel and Russia are there to be seen, right? And if he goes all in on supporting Israel here, then he's might be seen to support annexation, which is kind of self-defeating. So he needs to be really careful on how he how he shows his support for Israel because Israel, other than the whole annexation thing, is kind of an ally of Ukraine that he would kind of like to have as an ally, given that they hate Iran and that they've got a really good defense military industrial complex and that he would like equipment from from Israel. So he needs to he needs to play that card really carefully, I think. Um I'd be interested to see what you think if there's any Israelis watching this what what you think. Um but but yeah, so uh, uh we'll see how how the narrative develops in terms of how Zelensky um plays this. Uh, so saying it's about self-defense like you've been attacked by hamas so aside from anything else you've got a right to defend yourselves if if you're attacked attacked in that way so that's kind of the safest thing you can say i guess so here's what the isw says the kremlin is already and will likely continue to exploit the hamas attacks in israel to advance several information operations intended to reduce u.s and western support and attention to ukraine so the kremlin amplified several information operations following hamas attacks in israel on the 7th primarily blaming the west for neglecting conflicts in the middle east in favor of supporting ukraine and claiming that international community will cease to pay attention to ukraine by portraying uh attention to the Middle East, or alternatively Ukraine, as a zero-sum comparison. Deputy Chairman of the Russian Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, claimed that the US and its allies should have been busy with working on Palestinian-Israeli settlement rather than interfering with Russia and providing Ukraine with military aid. Do you know what? You can walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, The Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs accused the West of blocking efforts by a necessary corset of Russia, the US, the European Union, and the UN leading to the escalation in violence, implicitly blaming the West for the current fighting. Prominent Russian propagandist Sergei Mardan, and I reported this yesterday, stated directly that Russia will benefit from the escalation of the world. Quote, we will t- we- it will take its mind off Ukraine for a while and get busy, once again putting out the eternal fire in the Middle East. 
These Kremlin narratives target Western audiences to drive a wedge in military support for Ukraine, seek to demoralize Ukrainian society by claiming Ukraine will lose international support and intend to reassure Russian domestic audiences that the international society will ignore Ukraine's war effort. Right. This is my complete speculation. They, of course, will try to do this. This is what, what we in the information space and in the general population need to be aware of, that, that Russia will be stoking things up here they will be poking the hornet's nest and blaming the west so be careful of that and be careful of fake news and propaganda coming out from from russia i hope my 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 hope here would be that the israeli defense forces they kind of train for this it's what they wait for they've been waiting for or they, there will be strategies in place for the, exactly this kind of of eventuality although it has happened as a massive surprise and have been caught off guard I'm fairly sure the Israeli defense forces are capable enough to deal with this and deal with it big time. So I don't think that the international community will need to massively come to Israel's aid, although I think the US has already offered military aid. Uh, and yeah, so it's a, it will be best for Ukraine if Israel can contain this themselves, is basically my conclusion. Whether that will happen, we'll see. So, hands that pushed Hamas attack are in Moscow, says Nexter. According to Richard Kemper, retired British Army colonel, the war in Israel is not just a brutal attack by terrorists from Gaza. Quote, I'm willing to engage directly with NATO. Putin is, is instead fueling conflicts between Azerbaijan and Armenia, Serbia and Kosovo, in West Africa and now in Israel. And this is a really good point to, to, to remember here that you are seeing, you are seeing Serbia uh, being... Uh, you know, discontent being fermented in Serbia over Kosovo by Russia. You are seeing elements of Russian influence uh, in the coups that have taken place in this whole Sahel area of Africa uh, and where there have been, there's been one coup after another there. You are seeing Azerbaijan and Armenia, although they've kind of taken their eye off the ball, the the Russians here, they will no doubt be now trying to work out how they can use it to their advantage to get distraction uh, and attention diverted to there rather than in Ukraine. So there are so many things going on at the moment. And then, of course, you know, you've got Israel and Hamas and they'll be, you know, trying to stir things up to their advantage. So everyone is is looking over here and ignoring Ukraine and they will then take a, take advantage of that themselves. So that is what will be happening for sure. Um, Israel and Ukraine have a common enemy. Without Moscow's consent, Hamas militants would not have attacked, says Zion Alon, head of the Israeli political party Ahazon. So that's interesting. Uh, Lavrov already implicitly supported this. Uh, so you've got some Israeli recognition of Russian influence going on there. And at the same time, the Iraqi unit... Al, uh, Al Shabi declared its support for Hamas. I don't know how serious that is, but, the, but, but my larger point is that there's a great deal of destabilization that we that will be going on here, which is never good for anyone interested interested in rules based orders and you know economic and welfare stability throughout the world. Okay. All at the same time, you've still got Assad and Russian forces bombing hospitals in the city of Idlib in Syria, right? So don't forget there's also stuff going down elsewhere that Russia is involved in. So Syria, uh, which is, you know, close enough to Israel here, is, as as I've talked to you so many times before, the whole point of Russia defending uh the Assad regime is that it gives them access to this warm water port in the Mediterranean. So th that they have that access is absolutely critical to uh, their geopolitical game of chess that they are playing, Russia. So they are supporting the Assad regime and in so doing are doing all the things that, we, that we've seen them do over time, which is, say, for example, Idlib, you know, they're bombing hospitals. Is that something they're doing on purpose? Yes. We know that they do that on purpose. They've done it for years in Syria, and it's what they've been doing in, in Ukraine as well. So don't forget that, that Russia are involved in all sorts of moves to destabilize uh, parts of the world to their advantage. Um, and and that that is, I, I guess, the big takeaway point here is that um, you know, everything they're doing is not from a kind of objective moral standpoint, but it's from 
uh, a standpoint of of how can we cause trouble uh, between multiple other entities that are effectively not a lot to do with us so that that everyone else is worrying about this and all the shit's hitting the fan and we sit back and eat the popcorn and hopefully benefit in the long run out of this and and there are so many instances of this around the world um that's kind of my take it's not not a particularly deep take it's not a particularly um sophisticated political uh analysis at all but that's just a rough and ready take on what is going on um let me know what you think and if you're an expert in this part, neck of the woods then let us know in the threads below and and give us your tuppence about what is uh, taking place i uh, hope hope that's useful thank you so much for all your support please like subscribe and share uh take care and i'll speak to you a little bit later